you know, as I, you know, most of y'all have heard the news this week about the events in Chattanooga and, um, you know, the attack on our military there, um, you know, and, and um, a lot of these types of things have been happening around the world, uh, you know, and we're aware of them, but when it's so close to home, it really uh, tends to kind of wake uh, irate a nerve or whatever, you know, and, and uh, gets us maybe thinking a little bit more about it. And, and um, you know, there's really no doubt in my mind that what we're facing with the rise of Islam and uh, their desire to dominate the world, um, that it's a spiritual battle. And um, so, you know, while not all Arabs are Muslim and, you know, uh, not all Muslims are terrorists, you know, uh, there is a war raging. And it's a spiritual battle. And, um, you know, there's, there's a, listen, there are uh, Arabs and even Muslims in droves who are becoming Christians throughout the world, which I praise the Lord for because the countries they live in, um, you don't become a Christian uh, for popularity, if you know what I mean. Uh, for many of them, the decision to follow Christ, they know it means isolation from their families, and a lot of times it means uh, a death sentence. And so when you decide to follow Jesus, and you know that's what you're getting, uh, you can pretty much know for sure it's for real, right? You, you would think it would be anyway. And so, uh, but, you know, it, it's not just a, a spiritual battle. I think it, it's a, it's a, there's a political battle too. And, but I'm not here, I'm not worried about the political battle because, like I've said before, Jesus is my king. I'm not a permanent resident here. I'm a citizen of his kingdom. And uh, that's where uh, I'll wind up. And he's preparing a place for me there. And so, uh, what do I have to fear, right? And so, hopefully, we can take that attitude and we can go with that. But, but, uh, and I've been preparing. It's been really difficult, and especially with the limited time I have. But some of you are aware I've been trying to prepare a series of sermons on the end times, um, and I've just been intrigued with how um, the Islamic scriptures, the Quran, and the Hadith aligns with our prophecies of end times and I don't think it's a coincidence and so I want to share some of that with you because I feel like God's called me uh, to help prepare us and our children for what's coming and so uh, but I, I don't want to fault, misrepresent I want to make sure it's something that's worth our time and it's a little bit out of the scope of how I normally preach and so I'm having a little bit of trouble just in my limited amount of time to prepare it so y'all pray for me God will prepare, help me to prepare that because I think it's really important. And hopefully I can get that uh, done and start it here before long. But, but you know, there, there's a fear today. People are filled with anxiety. They're, they're filled with worry and confusion. And, uh, you know, a lot of folks are looking for leadership that will give them confidence and hope. And, um, you know, a lot of people just don't know where to turn. And a lot of times we turn to the wrong places. And, uh, you know, the news media is not the place to turn. Listen, our government is not the place to turn. Um, you know, and with all that, I was reminded of thinking about this this week. Uh, this passage came to my heart and mind. And I, I knew without a doubt this is what we needed to preach to you today. Um, hopefully it will give us some clear direction, some comfort, and some hope. It's found in Second Chronicles chapter 7. And I'm going to read beginning in verse 1, but I'll, the focal point of the message will come through verses 12 and 15, but I've got to give you a little background, okay? So if you if you start in uh, 2 Chronicles chapter 6, what you read is Solomon, King Solomon, who was the son of David. He was the offspring of David and Bathsheba, if you know that story. Uh, but anyway, he uh, followed King David uh, as the king of Israel, and uh, he... Uh, finished, I guess, what David started in building a temple uh, and a, uh, a home for himself. And in chapter 6, he's finishing all that up. And um, so he built it on the Temple Mount in Jerusalem where the Dome of the Rock is now, pretty much. And so, uh, but the remains of what you see there is not Solomon's temple. It's it's Herod's, uh, I guess. But anyway, that's a whole other story. If you want to do the research, feel free. If you got any questions, talk to me. I might have an answer. I don't know. But but uh, when, when Solomon finished building the temple, uh, I want you to read what uh, 
He said he prayed a prayer of dedication. And in verse 1 of uh, chapter 7, whoop, there it is. It says, As soon as Solomon finished his prayer, fire came down from heaven and consumed the burnt offering and the sacrifices, and the glory of the Lord filled the temple. And the priests could not enter the house of the Lord. Remember that capital L, capital O, capital R, capital D? I've, that that word, anytime you see that in your Bible, in many translations, when it's like that, it's there for a reason because that reflects the name of God, Yahweh, or Jehovah, that the Jews say was too holy to be written. And so in their writings, they would substitute it with letters and these things. And so we signify that in a lot of English translations by capital L-O-R-D. Okay, so... That's the name. That's I am. That's what that means. That's the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Just want to clear that up. And so the priest could not enter the house of the Lord God because the glory of the Lord filled the Lord's house. And when all the people of Israel saw the fire come down and the glory of the Lord on the temple, they bowed down with their faces to the ground on the pavement. Didn't know they had a pavement, did you? And worshipped and gave thanks to the Lord, saying, For He is good, for His steadfast love endures forever. Then the king and all the people offered sacrifice before the Lord. And so, wow, isn't that, that's, that's pretty astounding when you read that. And you see what happened. The glory of the Lord filled that place. And it was noticeable. And, it, and the glory filled the place so powerfully that the priest couldn't even enter it. And um, so I want to help uh, make a little bit of a, uh, show some of the sim symbolism that's going on here. So when Solomon built the temple, what he was building uh, was, you know, the 40 years in the wilderness when the, he, the Hebrews were wandering around after they left Egypt, they had something called the tabernacle. Maybe you're familiar with that. And what it was was it was the place for, of worship and, and it was separated by curtains and in the back place there was a place reserved for the Ark of the Covenant. Anybody that's seen Indiana Jones knows about the Ark of the Covenant. And that's where the Ark of the Covenant was. And the Ark of the Covenant was the place where once a year the priests would go in, they would make atonement for the people by offering an offering there. It was a special place. And uh, the mercy seat was there. And so uh, that, and so there's a lot to learn here for some of you that not, maybe not know some of this stuff, but, but it's a special place. And that place was known as the place where God dwelt. Okay? And it was, it was sacred. And uh, there's a lot of significance to that, to a lot of what happens, even the welling wall now and all that. And so if you're interested, just, just have a conversation with me sometime or look it up and start studying. But, but this is what they did, and it was a tent. And, you know, they were nomads at the time. You know, they were moving around, and, you know, they, they, and so they would pack up that thing, and they would put these posts through the Ark of the Covenant, and they would carry it, and then they would set it back up wherever they were. And, and um, anyway, it, and so what this uh, tabernacle represented was a place of worship and the place where it represented God's dwelling place was among His people. Okay? And now when Solomon built the temple, uh, it was a permanent tabernacle, or it was supposed to be permanent. We know because of history that it wasn't exactly permanent, but, but it was a permanent dwelling place for God. Uh, you know, King David looked around, he saw... Uh, people living in uh, brick homes and stuff, but God lived in a tent. So he wanted to build God something, you know, uh, beautiful. And so Solomon's temple was obviously beautiful. If you know anything about it, you can do some research. But, but here it was. It's all symbolic in a sense because the New Testament, when we go to the New Testament and Christ and His covenant, Christ reveals to us that we are God's permanent dwelling place. And we become the tabernacle of, of the Holy Spirit of God. And the Holy Spirit of God comes to indwell us and fill us. And as soon as Solomon finished his prayer, fire came down from heaven, consumed the burnt offering and the sacrifices, and the glory of the Lord filled the temple. You see, it's God's desire to fill us and dwell in us and for His glory to be manifested through us, just like this. There's a lot of symbolism here. And so... Today, God's permanent dwelling place is in the hearts of men and women and boys and girls who surrender to Him in faith and follow Him. That's where God dwells. And um, He dwells in us. We dwell in Him. He gives us life. And so, now, we jump on down to uh, verses 12 through uh, 15 here. Um, we see... 
the focal text that I want us to see here this morning. It says, Then the Lord appeared to Solomon in the night, and He said to him, I have heard your prayer, and I've chosen this place for myself as a house of sacrifice. And so look, God chose this place. Solomon built it, but God chose to live there. You know, you can build a house. You remember the uh, the movie uh, Field of Dreams? You know, you can build it. If you build it, they'll come. I guess the same thing. If you invite God, He'll come. Solomon built it. God chose to come. But anyway, when I shut up the heavens, look what he says. When I shut up the heavens so that there is no rain, or command the locusts to devour the land, or send pestilence among my people, look what he says in verse 14. If my people who are called by my name humble themselves and pray, and seek my face, and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven, and I will forgive their sin, and heal their land. And then God says, Now, my eyes will be open, and my ears attentive to the prayer that's made in this place. You see, God's listening for this prayer. He's listening for this prayer from His people. So I want us to look at this for, for a moment. You know, after the dwelling place of God was finished, God knew that there would be times of trouble. You know, that there would be times when His people are under attack by the enemy. Times when we're under affliction from disease and famine, pestilence, whatever that is. And even times, you know, when we're attacked from within, you know. God knew all these things would take place. And so God gave Solomon this prescription. You need a prescription when things aren't going good, don't you? Let's use the medical analogy. You know, you, you got to get a prescription, right? And, and we're, we, we're in a drug-induced uh, society. We know all about medication. but um, So we need a prescription. So this morning what I want us to see is this prescription for healing. You know, it, it's a prescription for maintaining a healthy relationship. When your relationship with God's not right, and when it seems like you're being attacked from every side, and when it seems like you can't go on with life, and you're discouraged and depressed and defeated, God has an answer for you. And that's what I want to see. It's a prescription to, to pull you out of this disease of sin and give you hope. Okay? And so, it's a promise of deliverance. So look at verse 14 again. Look what he says. This is where we're going to focus most of our time. If my people... Let's see, wait a minute, I think, I, here we go. Order. Emphasize a few highlighted words here. See that? If my people, who are called by my name, humble themselves, pray, seek my face, turn from their wicked ways. See that? If, if his people do these things, look what he says. He's, it's conditional. You see it? Then I will hear from heaven, and I will forgive their sin, and heal their land. See that? If then. If then. You know? It's, it's, it's conditional. And so, um, if you want healing, if you want rescued out of the bondage you're in, the pitiful state of mediocrity and unsatisfaction with life, mostly because of you. That's most of my depression and, and, uh, and uh, dissatisfaction is because of me. It's not really because of who we want to blame it on. It's because we don't have a right relationship with God. If we give ourselves totally and completely to Him, those things don't exist. They exist because we don't have good fellowship with the Father. Something's amiss. Okay? That's just the truth. I know some of you are getting cut right now. I am too. Uh, but look, if you got cancer, we got to open it up, reveal it, so we can get it out. And that's what this text does. And so, let's look at this this morning. What I want you to see are, are, is this prescription. I think there's five different uh, points we want to point or bring out here to help us. I want you to recognize this. First of all, uh, well, uh, Alexa, you help me stay on task here. But our text shows us a prescription for healing. I've already said that. But let's look at these five tasks. Number one, healing. Whoops. Sorry. Healing is available to those who are His. Now God may choose to heal people who are not His, and sometimes those kind of things happen. Uh, uh, but, but what we're talking about here is a spiritual healing, a spiritual wholeness. And to be spiritually whole, you have to be one of, one of God's. 
see? And how do we know, you know, that that uh, that we're what he's talking about here? Well, the condition. If you go back and look at the text, it says he says, "If my people." who are called by my name. Now, let me go ahead and say, this is a prescription for Jerusalem, or for the Jews, and for Israel. And uh, my whole point in bringing it over into our context today is that I believe the promise is true today for us as believers, but in a little bit different sense. For him, it was about, for him and for Israel, it was about the enemies that were around, the spiritual and physical enemies. But it's the same for us today, but mostly it's an internal spiritual battle that we're talking about today. Because God's dwelling place is not in a building. God's dwelling place is not going to be in that building on Monroe Street. That's just a building. That's why I'm not big on steeples, because it's just a building, a place where the church meets. The church is the people of God. And that's just a gathering place, just like this is just a gathering place. Just a place where we meet, one of the many places where we gather, right? And but but we're his people. We are God's people. God has called us. He has chosen us. And he says, if the, my people, the ones who are called by my name, he says, if they will do these things, then I will hear them. I will forgive them, and I will heal them. You know, God has a love and passion for people, and and he loves everybody. But for those who uh, follow him. Those who surrender to Him. Those who call Him Father. Those who call Jesus Savior and Lord. There's a special place reserved because they become the children of God. In Matthew chapter 18 and verse 11, Jesus said you know, that the Son of Man has come to seek and to save those who are lost. God loves everybody. And He, he, want, he has a desire for everyone to be saved. But in John chapter 1 and verse 12, when John's writing about the incarnation of, of the Son of God and Him becoming flesh, the Word becoming flesh and dwelling among us and, and how, uh, you know, the disciples, how they saw Him and they felt Him and, uh, and He was real and they beheld His glory. He said, but as, but, and He says, but He came unto His own and, and His own did not receive Him. The world did not receive Him. But, he says in verse 12, but as many as received Him, to them He gave the right to become what? The children of God. To all who received Him, He gave them the right to become the children of God, even to those who believe in His name. That's what it says. And so we're adopted into the family of God because of the love of God. And we are His children, full-fledged children. And God brings healing to those who are His. And so when we're down and out and we're hurting and we're grieving and we're in despair and we're not at peace and we're not comforted, that's not God's fault. He's got everything we need to get us to the state we need to be in. All we need to do is call out to Him. You know, when I was little and I was hurting, you know, in the middle of the night, I would just call out, Mama! You know? Because somehow, you know, Mama could make it better. Almost every time, you know? And, you know, she didn't answer the kids next door even though they were cousins, you know? But, but she always answered my call because I was hers, you know? When we adopted Kobe and Si, um, you know, when they were in the orphanage in Ghana, before we adopted them, and some of you know the story, we legally, legally adopted them on September the 26th. Is that right? Anyway, 19th, that's right. And uh, 26th was the day we came home. But September 19th, 2012, right? Okay, sorry. But anyway, but we didn't get to bring them home until February 2013. So we had to leave them in this orphanage in Ghana. But we were responsible for them. That was kind of weird, you know. We're, we got two new kids. They're, what, four years old at the time we left, and we couldn't bring them back with us. But look at this. But we were coming back to prepare a place for them so that one day, and I told them when we left, I left them a note. They couldn't read it, but I asked them to read it. They couldn't even speak our language. But I asked somebody to read it to them. I said, we're going away to prepare a place for you, and we're coming back to get you so that you can be where we are. Something like that. Way. And so, just quoting Jesus, hey, you can't go wrong with that, right? And so, uh, but anyway, so we that's what we had to do. We had to go, and, and while we were gone, uh, you know, they had to get some medical attention and things like that, and uh, we provided for that. Why? Because they are ours. 
they are our children and um, so I'll do whatever I can to give my children whatever they need y'all know what I'm talking about and um, you know the same is true for our relationship with God he's going to give us all that we need we are his and healing is available to us and so even though we're not home yet our Heavenly Father he knows what's best for us and and for those of us who are his uh, he will hear us when you call out to him he will hear you a lot of times it, it, it may seem like he doesn't hear us but he will hear you call out to him he will hear you and and and, and he will take care of us and so I just want to ask you this morning are you his you know he's tenderly calling your name he wants you in his arms will you answer him and uh, if, if you want healing you must be one of his that's number one number two um, healing is available to those who are humble healing is available to those who are humble you know even though we're his he, the healing's not automatic you know um, I think I shared something similar to this a while a while back but there's got to be humility you know it, it, it's hard to help somebody uh, when um, when they're not humble you know when they're prideful you know it, it it's just you know it just makes you want to just push them away don't it uh, in a sense and and even your own child a lot of times you know when they're real prideful you want to teach them a lesson right but you don't really have to teach them they'll learn it on their own uh, but uh, you know, there have been times, uh, you know, humility is a sense of, of uh, you know, denying yourself almost and, and, and putting others' needs before your own, right? And so there's been times when Christy and I have had to team up and hold arms and legs and mouths open, you know, uh, to get medicine in some of our children. Y'all know what I'm talking about? Uh, it's amazing. You know, you, you find out how strong your kids are when you're about to give them something that they don't want. You know, and uh, Levi uh, has been, uh, he's a lot better now, but when he was little, it, ooh, it was tough with some of the stuff. He's got, had a bag, well, I won't get into that. But, it, but anyway, um, but, you know, you know what I'm talking about? And, and we're that way with God a lot of times. You know, God's trying to do something to us and give us something we need, and we're fighting him off, and, and, and you know, but, and, and that kind of thing. We just need to humble ourselves and let God give us our medicine, don't we? We just need to take it. Take it like a man, right? Uh, it's childish and it's selfish when we don't humble ourselves. You know, uh, pridefulness and you know the lack of humility, it, it's, it's, it's petty. It's, it's childish, you know. Uh, and I'm guilty of it plenty, so don't go start pointing them out, I know. But, uh, you know, too often I, I put, put myself before others. And, uh, you know, I'm, I'm heavily convicted about that a lot of times. But know this, though. Pride left unaddressed will eventually destroy every relationship. It will. If you're prideful and you're not loving and humble toward the person that you love, it'll destroy that relationship eventually. It will. Besides, you know, in James chapter 4 and verse 6, James, this is the brother of Christ, you know, half-brother, son of Mary and Joseph. He wrote, Grace, or excuse me, uh, God resists the proud, but gives grace to the humble. And so, God doesn't like pride either, does he? He, he likes a humble heart. And, um, you know, um, he also wrote in, in a, a couple of verses later, he says, Humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord, and He will lift you up. You see, we're all the time wanting to lift ourselves up, put ourselves first. But if we'll be patient and humble ourselves, God will exalt us in His time. That's where we have to. That's we have to trust him, don't we? And so Luke uh, the, uh, records Jesus saying the same thing. He says, "Whoever exalts himself will be humbled, and he who humbles himself will be exalted." I remember when I was when I was younger. Um, I like to brag on myself a lot because I wanted people to notice me. And, and I remember my mama telling me one day. She said, "Son, said if you're good enough, you won't have to say anything." other people will say it for you. It took me a long time to learn that. But uh, but anyway, unfortunately, still got somewhere to go, I guess. But but it's true, isn't it? Uh, Colossians 3.12 says to put, put on humility. Uh, you know, it, it, to dress yourself in humility in a sense and so that that's what others see. 1 Peter 5 says to be 
clothed with humility in a similar way. And in Ephesians chapter 4, four uh, Paul encourages us to walk with humility. And so, healing is available to those who are humble. We've got to humble ourselves. What we've got to do is be willing to accept the life that God has in store for us. Because we don't always get what we want, but God knows what's best, and God's working out all things for good, and we've got to trust Him in that. That's humility. To be willing to walk in the path that God has chosen for you. Even when it may not be where you want to go. Because if you love Jesus and you trust God, it's really where you want to be. You may not realize that yet. And so we've got to be willing to to give some, you know, to put aside our own personal ambitions and 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 as as believers who are serving to Christ, you know, it helps us unite when we're willing to put aside selfish ambitions and selfish goals and to come together unified in one goal. And we're going to learn a lot about that as we finish the church and or, or the building down here and we're trying to make decisions, you know, uh, it's not for one person to dominate and to decide. You know, it's for us all to participate and ultimately do what God wants us to do. Okay? And, and so, and it's that way with everything. God, you know, we're to do everything united in ambition, God, in God's glory to build His kingdom, ultimately to, to exalt the name of Jesus. And so, um, you know, the reason most of us don't experience the healing of God is because we're too proud. I really believe that. You know, uh, even though we know God's speaking to us and our hearts are convicted of sin, you know, and, and God wants us to publicly surrender to Him. And during the invitation time or in, during any time, especially during church when God's speaking to you and you become heavily convicted and, and you know God's calling you, but what happens is instead of getting up, instead of falling on your knees in prayer, instead of coming to me or JJ or Jeremy or, or, or anybody else in, in, in here, you know, one, of the, one of the ladies, and, and saying, hey, pray with me and help me, we sit still. And, and uh, you know, we keep silent and we reject the call of God. That's pride. All that is is pride because we don't want to get up because we don't want people talking about us or worried about what's going on. And, you know, we don't want to have to reveal things. And, and it's just pride. That's what it is. If you want God's healing, you got to open yourselves up. It's almost like, you know, uh, completely exposing yourself. That's what you got to do, you know, you, because, because God cannot heal us without that exposure. You know, if we're trying to cover up stuff that everybody knows about anyway, who are we fooled? You know? That's ridiculous. And so, it's a hard thing to do. But, you know, it's sin. And so I want to encourage you today to humble yourself and receive the Holy Spirit and be released from your prison of sin and selfishness. Be healed for His glory. You know? Healing is available to those who are His. Healing is available to those who are humble. And the third thing I want us to see is healing is available to those who are prayerful. Look, ultimately, healing comes uh, through righteous, faithful prayers of a bleeding heart. You hear me? If you're not praying to God, if you're not calling out to God, how is God going to hear you? We don't pray like we need to. That's the reason I, you know, I put out this plea for us to meet and pray at 10:30 on Sunday mornings, and and uh, you know we at least need to be doing that, and and uh, we need more people coming to that than are. I'll tell you, uh, uh, but uh, personal prayer can change your heart and allow God to use you powerfully in your life. You know, but sincere, unified, spirit-filled. Corporate prayer, when we all come together, can change the world. So it's one thing for us to have our quiet time, but when we can come together and pray, oh man, only God knows what He can do. You know? James tells us this. He says, confess your trespasses or confess your sins to one another and pray for one another that you may be healed. You hear that? He says the effective, fervent prayer of a righteous man is powerful and effective. 
Do we do this? Do we do this? Oh man, do we really confess our sins to one another? Most of the time I say no, we don't, do we? I mean, uh, but I mean, I've heard all the time people say, I don't have to confess my sins to anybody but God. Oh really? What does the Bible say? The Bible just said we need to confess our sins to one another, didn't it? Didn't it? That's what I read. That's, that's from the Bible. Now, I'm not saying you have to tell everyone all of your sins, but you need somebody in your life who is a strong Christian. You need somebody in your life that's a stronger believer than you, that you can go to, that you know is going to love you no matter what you tell them. And you can tell them your sins, and they can help you overcome those things in your life. They can pray with you and set up uh, uh, barriers and walls and structure to help you avoid those uh, entrapments of sin. We need that. Every one of us do. That's what he's talking about. Huh? That feels good. Yeah, it does. Hey,